Our uh, final speaker this morning is Martin Fleming. Martin is a Vedanta philosopher and Vaishnav Hindu theologian. He is director of Buckland Hall, a conference and retreat center in Wales, and president of the Science and Philosophy Initiative, an organization that aims to integrate the studies of consciousness, matter, life, and the universe within a science-consistent philosophical model with insights from the Vedanta School of Philosophy. He is also a broadcaster and advisor to the BBC on Indian philosophical and spiritual traditions. After uh, Martin's presentation, we'll have a 15 minute break and then come back here for our final presentation of the morning. Please welcome Martin Fleming. Thank you very much, Joshua. Let me see if I've got all my materials. <laughs> yes, we're all here. And a little water. Anyway, I'm very, very pleased to have been invited um, uh, to, to speak this morning. And particularly, uh, I'm very grateful to be following uh, Brenda's presentation because I think that leads into uh, a number of the points that um, I'd like to make. Um, I only got to meet Brenda quite recently, although. For many, many years, I've been a great fan of the pair uh, work and research, and I have their little gizmos on my desk, and uh, myself and Kunal, we have done all sorts of various experiments on uh, the effect of conscious intention on physical systems, and we've also um, worked quite hard at the remote perception, the PRP experiments as well. And also, um, I was very pleased that we were able to uh, gather um, Stuart, uh, Professor Stuart Hameroff and uh, have his presentation last night because our organization, the Science and Philosophy Initiative, managed to bring him to uh, Oxford University and we uh, had his presence there and we had a great evening with him and Sir Roger Penrose um, and got to explore many of their ideas. But my topic today is, yes, it's there. Why consciousness is a big deal for science. And first I should apologize that I'm here as a philosopher. And scientists and philosophers don't always have a comfortable relationship. In fact, I've heard scientists say, well, you can go to philosophers for questions, but don't ever listen to their answers. <laughs> so, and I think that's been actually generous by them because I don't think they, uh, the scientists really like the sort of questions that we like to ask them. And philosophers get frustrated because scientists seem to prefer to answer questions other than the ones that the philosophers pose. So my job here today is to ask uncomfortable questions and to ask the scientists to search for answers, but not in the places that they are habituated and comfortable looking for, but where they might have a better chance of finding those answers. And nowhere is this more important than in the study of consciousness. Now, Consciousness, a mystery in our faces at every moment, according to the British uh, neuroscientist Anil Seth. And he explained that we really don't have any definitive definitions of what we mean by consciousness. At the moment, we really have just folk definitions. And here's one contender. Consciousness, that annoying time between naps. <laughs> yep, it's that thing that bothers it from morning to night, <laughs> and even then keeps us awake. So, is consciousness just the content of our inner world, thoughts, ideas, emotions, feelings, and so on? Or is it the processing by neural activity that produces such mental content? Or is it the felt experiences of mental content? Or the property that enables that awareness? Or is consciousness that thing that possesses the property of subjective awareness and experience? Now, not everything that passes for the study of consciousness encompasses all of those aspects. The empirical study tends to focus on how mental states and content correlate with the neuroscience of the brain. But such limited empiricism is only one part of the picture. And as we heard from Howard, it's an approach that ignores both the subject and experience 
of the subject, <laughs> the experience of the subject of the experience. So even if we don't have a definition, we need to be clear what must be included in any explication of consciousness. And John Searle posted like this, the essential trait of consciousness that we need to explain is unified qualitative subjectivity. Bit of a mouthful, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit. So allow me to generalize first that the approach that neural functions alone can account for all aspects of consciousness, and I'm calling that the brain model. So it just as a shorthand, it's a generalized way of any theory of consciousness that tends to presume that the brain can account for all aspects of consciousness, we're calling the brain model. And I'm going to ask if this brain model is really up to the challenge of explaining unified qualitative subjectivity. And we're going to start the exploration with a very profound question for you all. Do you exist? We've got a live audience? Okay, I take it that you do. At least, and if you don't, well, you're not listening to me anyway. <laughs> no, why? But the question is, why do we ex believe that we exist? It's, it's intuitive. We accept that I am experiencing what I call my life, that I am the subject of my experience. Not just at this moment, but I have been the same I experiencing my life since my earliest memory of it. So who or what is the entity that is the continual subject of my experiences? Now, Howard referred to um, an aspect of Descartes' meditations in which he was able to doubt the existence of the external world. But there's a corollary of that, and that is, what can I know for certain? And Descartes explored that. And his conclusion is that the only thing I can be utterly certain of is that I am the entity contemplating that question. I am a thinking thing. Now, all the thoughts that I may be thinking may be wrong, they may be illusion, they may just be silly. But the fact that I am the subject of the experience of those thoughts, that's my certainty. And really that is our only certainty from which to progress from. Now, the brain model struggles to identify any organ, system or process within the brain that could reasonably account for this subjective phenomenon. And please note, I just want to make a, a clarity. When I'm talking about subjective experience, I'm going to be discussing the self as the subject of that experience. But this is the conscious self. And I will use the phrase the conscious self to distinguish it from other forms of psychological selfhood um, to do with persona, personality, social interactions, and so on. We're talking about the subject of the experience as the conscious self. The other types of selfhood are forms of mental content which the subject experiences. I identify with and I experience it. So, the second aspect of this analysis is the qualitative bit of John Searle's uh, definition. And this involves the mysterious thing we call qualia. Now, this term was coined by Charles Sanders Peirce way back in the 19th century. It was then developed by Clarence Lewis in the 20s, but despite its significance, it was pretty well ignored by the behaviorism and cognitive neuropsychology trends of the 20th century. And actually, we have our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Stuart Hammeroff, to really thank for encouraging the re-emergence of this concept, particularly during the first Science of uh, Consciousness conference he organized way back in 94. And last night, you saw the... Uh, photograph of the whole team of them there at the Grand Canyon. So, after, when the, on the first day of the uh, conference there, after a couple of very uninspiring, in fact boring, lectures, and that was Stuart's words, he, as he explained to me, not my, <laughs> up steps a long-haired uh, long young David Chalmers, and he challenges the entire consciousness community that they have to recognize the significance of qualia. So he explained, the hard problem of consciousness is subjective experience. How does a bunch of 86 billion neurons interacting inside the brain produce the subjective experience of qualia? 
And to this day, and he, he kind of coined the phrase, as was mentioned last night, the hard problem. And this continues to haunt neuroscientists and philosophers to this day. As Professor Michael Tai of Stanford uh, writes, the status of qualia is hotly debated in philosophy, largely because it is central to our proper understanding of the nature of consciousness. So what are qualia? Now, hands up who's familiar with this term qualia? Not a huge number, and that's fairly standard, even in a, an August assembly like this where we are talking about consciousness. And it just demonstrates that this word is not being given a fair outing, and its significance is not being properly discussed broadly with the public and in academia. So, qualia is derived from the Latin, it's in the plural, the singular is quale, and qualia are most commonly related to what we experience qualitatively during sensory reception. I'll unpack this. It's the internal and subjective components of sense perception. We're used to thinking of our sense perception as what's out there. But now I'm going to ask you to think about how you're experiencing sense perception inside. And the archetype example of qualia is this, the redness of red. So the experience of redness that you're all gathering from the screen is different to your experience of the blueness of blue. Now please note, when we talk about qualia, we are not talking about the emotional response that you have to a particular color. That is a different thing. We're talking about the actual experience of redness. So the actual quale of redness is, it's, is the experience that you have of redness. What it is like to undergo the visual experience of the color of red as redness. And it's a real experience. There's an actuality of what it is likeness to experience that quale that distinguishes it from any other type of color-related qualia you might experience. There are no such things as subconscious qualia, because qualia are what are actually apprehended. And although we may examine the actuality of qualia by mindful introspection, and this is sometimes uh, referred to a lot, that you could introspect qualia, because just as I'm asking you to think about what it is like to experience redness, you are introspecting that experience. However, qualia are being experienced all the time. Whether you think about it or not, you're always enjoying colors and forms and movement in your experiences. You don't have to realize that you're doing, you don't have to be mindful of it, you're automatically experiencing qualia. So this criteria of the experience of qualia without the requirement for mindful introspection, may, as, may allow us to then ascribe the trait of, un, sort of, of unified qualitative subjectivity to other species. And I suggest that is the test we use for ascertaining consciousness in other species. Not a question of can they use language, not a question if they've got theory of mind, not a question of introspection. Do they undergo the subject experience of, uh, subjective experience of qualia. And qualia are subjective, private, ineffable, because you cannot describe what you're experiencing internally to someone else. Try it. Think about how you might experience what is your experience of redness to someone who has monochrome vision. Now, even if we do it among ourselves, we just have to start pointing, oh, that's, see, that's a red, that's red. But without using, that's not useful. You can't use comparatives. What is your experience of redness to someone who has um, monochrome vision? And the best example of uh, the subjective experience of qualia, which appeared and broke the internet a few years back, is that dress. Okay, hands up, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. Hands up, gold and white. Hands up, black and blue. All right, argue amongst yourselves. <laughs> I, 
I've had situations where fights have broken out. <laughs> People just cannot believe that someone else is seeing that dress in a different color than they are. They really can't believe it. <laughs> so, qualia possess inexplicable qualities. Even after the incredible progress of neuroscience, we cannot explain the nature of qualia with reference to the known functions and attributes of the brain. I'm going to unpack this issue using an illustration from a framework for consciousness, which was an, a 2003 paper written by Francis Crick and Chris, oh, oh, sorry, I should have, it was black and blue, by the way, but that doesn't matter. The fact is that you argue over it. <laughs> this is the, uh, the slide. Now, what this slide did in this uh, paper of a framework for consciousness was try to analyze the sequence of, of things that are happening during visual uh, perception. And um, yeah. you start here with the outside world. Light is bouncing off it. It's entering into the eye. It's then been processed at the back. And as Stuart Hammer explained, it goes through several sequences. But basically, wherever it is in the cortical um, areas, it ends up as electrical signals being passed along um, from the soma and the axons of these neurons. And really, you can represent it all as that sort of data. OK? That's what's happening. And we're, we're pretty good at analyzing that. We can get right down to seeing which neuron is firing connected to a particular experience. So even though it's hugely complicated science, it has been referred to that that is, are the easy problems. That's the easy bit. We can work out how light gets turned into electricity, where it goes to in the brain, and the patterns that are set up. That's the easy bit. But there's the other bit of the picture. This bit, that's where the hard problem is. Somehow or other, the digital data of the brain is converted into the experience of an image. We take that for granted. We are completely naive about what is going on there. We just assume that because our eyes look at something, we should see a picture. But all your brain has got is data, neural data, electricity, ions jumping across synapses. That's what your brain has got. But that's not what you are experiencing. You're experiencing a picture in your mind. Where did that come from? What is the mechanism that generates that? How is it that my brain, just with its electrical activity, but I experience that data as a picture with the qualia features of forms, colors, and motion? That is the hard problem. And to give him their credit, in that same paper, Crick and Cox state, the most difficult aspect of consciousness is the so-called hard problem of qualia, the redness of red, the painfulness of pain, and so on. No one has produced any plausible explanation as to how the experience of the redness of red could arise from the actions of the brain. And this problem isn't just the visual one. It pertains to all sensory experiences, auditory, tactile, gustatory, and olfactory. Our senses gather chemical and physical information and convert it into electrical signals sent to different cortical areas of the brain, but we experience something entirely different in nature, qualitatively different, hence the term qualia. We experience that electrical data as qualia, sounds, sensations, flavors, fragrance. And that remains inexplicable to this day. So what forms of mental content possess qualia? Well, typically it's accepted, as I mentioned earlier, that um, experiences rising from sensory stimulus. That's fine, they have qualia. But it's also recognized that the internal sensations such as hunger, thirst, pain, and so on, they possess qualia. There is something that is, it is like to experience them. We know what the data is, but you experience something different. Pain you think is simple. You, look, you know, um, Stuart Hammerhoff is an anesthetist. He surely should know about pain. And we have analgesics. We Surely we know what's going on. We know what's happening in the neurons of the brain, but we don't understand why we would experience that as, oh, 
why there's a feeling attached to that neural activity and how that is, um, how that is produced as a feeling. So it remains, um, so, but it is still counted as qualia there. The third type are emotional states, happiness, sadness, fear, and so on. But it is not still broadly accepted that thoughts, ideas, recalled memories, desires, um, these aren't generally um, accepted as qualia, but I argue that they should be. I say that there is, it can be established that there is a specific what it is likeness contained in each and every one of those experiences. Hence, my suggestion is that the qualitative nature of the experience of all forms of mental content, that should be our definition of qualia. Are qualia the properties of their bearers? That's a fancy way of saying, are they just inherent prop qualities of something out there, the, uh, the world? And that includes even describing them as properties of um, uh, space-time. And just to ex explore this, because we're covering a lot of ground quite quickly, so I can only give uh, very uh, simple, quick uh, examples. We're told that light is colored, isn't it? That's how you're taught. Each wavelength is a different color of light. Isn't that what you're told? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> and Isaac Newton was the first person. I mean, he, play, he was the one who played with these spectrum and did all these sort of uh, experiments. So he raised the question, well, if light, color is a specific wavelength, then which wavelength is magenta? Which one is it? And of course it isn't. There is no single wavelength that represents the color. It's a mixture. It's when there's blue light and there's red light in proximity, you will interpret that as magenta. But two different wavelengths don't mix together and form a new wavelength. That's not physics. <laughs> And in fact, your eye receives the blue and the red separately, deals with them by different cones, sends different messages to your brains. So there is no mixing out there of light, of color. The mixing happens after the fact of the electricity arriving in your brain. Color is generated by the mind. I'm going to ask you to do this little experiment, but please do not do this if there is any sensitivity with your eyes. I just want you to cover your eyes very tightly with your hands, okay? So that you're not seeing anything, although you will start to see little specks of light appearing in front of you. Now I'm gonna ask you to press firmly and almost as in a point way, and just wait and see what has starts to happen. Do it gently, don't do anything that's gonna damage yourself. And are you seeing colors? So you are seeing colors and there is no light involved. Color is not a property of the external world. It is an interpretation by your mind of the data that your brain has received. So this gives us a flavor of the problematic nature of qualia. So, time doesn't permit me to give some more examples, which I'd love to kind of tease you with uh, on all this. Of course, what our senses receive from external objects and what we experience are going to be related. But the format of the inherent properties of the object, the outside world, has been transformed several times over before being encoded in the digitalized data of the brain. And it is the, what it is likeness to experience that data the experience of the qualia that cannot be resolved to the format of the data in the brain. And in fact, you cannot reduce the nature of qualia to any known properties within physics. So no wonder Professor Ty again of Stanford says, for many, qualia are seen as the de facto evidence of consciousness being non-neural. If, no, if the experiences of qualia are actually irreducible to any known neural process, 
or even irreducible to any known physical properties, what does this say about the conscious self who experiences itself as the observer of qualia? Must that also be non-neural, also irreducible to physical qualities and properties? Thus, I would suggest that the brain model fails Searle's requirement of explaining unified qualitative subjectivity. But the interesting thing is that the brain model has problems even dealing with everyday perception. I'm going to give you two quickies. Um, oh, sorry, I should have put that up. Visual sparseness. Okay? This is a problem for all sensory reception. We're just going to look at the visual effect. Now, when your eyes gather information, coming in, flooding into your eyes through the, um, the iris and uh, focused on the retina, it's six billion uh, um, bits of data. And then, by the time that is all gathered by and processed by the cones and uh, rods and ready to send down the optic nerve, you're down to 10 million bits of data. By the time it reaches the visual processing areas, it's 10,000 bits. And they reckon used in any single uh, image, it is just 500 bits of data. That's the equivalent of two pixels in computing terms. That's your camera. Your camera is a two pixel camera. You could sell a few of those, couldn't you? So. <laughs> Instead of seeing the world as clearly and as detailed as that, really the data you've got is that. Oh, there you go. And that's been generous. So, it's no wonder that many, uh, you read the, uh, the materials, they'll say, the brain makes its best guess at what is going on based on the inputs of the senses. But here's another. Watch and... Now, in the short distance between us, I take it you are hearing and seeing the clap at the same time, right? Now, that's impossible for the brain because the brain takes half a second longer to process the visual data than it does the auditory data. So what is going on? Does the sound department, you know, we've, we've got a clap, we've just processed it, we've ring up the uh, visual thing and say, we think we've got something that sounds like hands moving, and, but what have you got? Uh, well, we've got something in the works now. Uh, it'll be along in a little bit. You know, could you give us another half second and we'll, we'll give you something to put out with the sound? That's not good enough. We need it now. We need to put it out now. Well, I'll tell you what you could do. You could just make it up. Just put out something. Just make it up and put it out now. In which case, if you're experiencing in real time, you must be experiencing a guess, a prediction. Or you could say, I uh, know what you could do, just would you hold on to the sound for a minute or for half a second and we'll put, I, I can do the Irish accent because that's where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not culturally appropriating. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what, just hold on to the, the, the sound for half a second We'll, have, we'll be finished with the uh, image, and then we'll put it out together. So that means you would be experiencing the world on with a half-second delay. You're experiencing on catch-up. What does that mean? So what I'm suggesting is that the results, uh, that the brain model, um, which tries to say that function, neural functions alone can account for consciousness, ends up either denying or dramatically downgrading the very thing it is supposed to explicate. Or it results in theories that are wholly inconsistent with everyday experience and intuitive convictions. Now it's important to note that the brain model to do that, to deny the self in this experience, um, does not arise from positive evidence to substantiate how consciousness is produced by the brain. Rather, it is based on the opposite. It is based on the negative findings that there is no organ, no process, no mechanism within the brain that can produce such phenomena. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that all researchers abandon their request for a neural basis of consciousness, but that presumption should not determine our only approach for exploring consciousness. And there's good reason why we require an alternative approach. What if consciousness is not a product of neural activity at any level of complexity? What if consciousness does not reduce to currently known properties? And what if it is its own distinct fundamental property of uh, reality? And I'm going to have to jump a few pages here. And um, the sergeant at arms will hopefully will give me a moment just to uh, choose where I kind of do the last little section. Um, and I'm actually disappointed to, uh, not to be able to explain in more detail the next fundamental question. Is consciousness simply the possessor of, of perception or does it also possess volition? And by volition we mean the will expressed to vary consciousness's own um, experience, content of experience and circumstance of experience. So we have, in the uh, Science and uh, Philosophy Initiative, propose a model based, and we draw some of the insights from Vedanta, Sankhya, and the yoga systems to indicate that we need to postulate consciousness as being the product, the property of a conscious self that we call the Atma, hence the Atma paradigm. And we propose that it interacts with uh, the brain through the interface of what we loosely call the mind. And the Sankhya system helps to really um, develop that kind of model through the functions and sub-functions that exist between the interface of the mind. Now, um, all I will just, to finish with, I'd just like to go to my last page. I'm in the same position as poor Howard, but <laughs> pages of <laughs> the presentation have been ditched, but that's my fault for, for perhaps throwing things in. So, so to sum up, there's clear rationale for proposing that consciousness might well be an irreducible property. This perspective of non-neural consciousness as a fundamental feature of reality accounts for subjective experience, perception, and psychological factors far more comprehensively than any solely physicalist approach. It also offers a way of integrating our sciences and humanities with the personal convictions and intuitions that we each have about the nature of our own existence. And through the weekend, we'll hear some more um, of the immense possibilities for research and discovery. And at tomorrow's workshop, I'll have a chance to fill in the bits that I've left out today. But where might this lead us? If we actually were serious about accepting that consciousness is a non-neural property, and we took that seriously, and we actually were willing to look at all our scientific evidence from that perspective, where might that take us? What are the possibilities for research and discovery that could arise from that? Where might they take us in the development of new technologies, applications, advances? And I suggest that they will unlock many of the conundrum plaguing current theories on the origin of life, speciation, cosmic fine-tuning, universal structure, quantum phenomena. I think we've got a key to unlocking so many of these so-called mysteries, hard problems through this process. So I finish by saying, all in all, I believe that science is better for embracing consciousness than by ignoring it. Consciousness isn't just a missing element of something that we need to find out about within everything else in science. Actually, uh, I'll get there now, science is the missing foundation. F science is missing its foundation. Consciousness is that foundation. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have another round of applause for all of our presenters this morning. What an amazing job. So, Martin, we, the non-neural observers of your presentation, have concluded that your talk has present provided a pleasant experience of qualia in our intellectual brains. Fifteen-minute break. See you all back here. Thank you.